Well, I see a lot of familiar faces, so that's always good. Um, and I want to do this pretty informal, so if you have a question as, I, as I'm going through this, please ask. And uh, I'll probably need to repeat the question so that we can get it on tape because this is going to be shared with other families as we go forward. Um, well, thanks for inviting me. It's always uh, always and welcome any opportunity that I can to talk about autism and, and to uh, help families out. And so I'm hoping that what I'll, what I'll have to share with you um, is going to be very helpful. What I wanted to talk about tonight when Julie asked me about some of the things that, that, um, that might be of interest is one of the things that I've really been working very hard on, and especially the last year or so, uh, and that is the, the internal or the unseen things about autism. You know, and, and, and the information I'm going to share with you, I want to tell you where the source is, and that is, is from my, I've been blessed and I consider myself very fortunate that I have a number of friends who are adults that are on the autism spectrum. And these adults who, um, like I said, are certainly my friends, but they're an amazing resource for me to talk to and for them to tell me pieces of information about what they were dealing with that they can reflect on as they were growing up, what they continue to deal with, and sort of their feelings about what they're dealing with. And so uh, it, it, uh, a, a good friend of mine who is a PhD student at Penn State, Scott Robertson, and I, uh, who we talk all the time. As a matter of fact, I spoke to him in the parking lot just before I came in here. Um, he and I started beginning to develop this whole conversation about the notion about uh, as issues that are maybe a little bit more uh, obvious and prevalent at a younger age, as some of those behaviors begin to to fade a little bit, that we, still, we have a tendency to think that because the behavior fades, then so does some of the things that were motivating that behavior at a younger age. And so he and I began to talk about some of the things that, that he was dealing with as an individual uh, on the spectrum. And it was, I found it very fascinating to, to, to uh, find out that as he got older, and as he was better able to regulate some of his own behaviors because he recognized them more, um, he began to realize that the people around him, his support network, began to actually think that everything was okay, that everything had kind of gone away. And what he was doing was dealing with it more internally now, and it created a lot of stress for him, which in turn created new behaviors that he had to deal with. And so... Scott's pretty insightful about his, his own uh, condition and his own personality and his own set of frustrations and his own set of successes. And so one of the fascinating things that that provides for somebody like myself as a clinician is that it, it, it sort of is giving me permission to have very in-depth conversations about things that... Now, Scott is very open with things. Now, he, he really doesn't mind talking about any aspect of his life. That's not true of some of my other friends. Um, even though we're, as we're developing this conversation, they're beginning to open up a little bit more and more with it as well too. Scott and I hope to be able to talk about this at, um, at Alltreat. Is anybody here familiar with Alltreat? Alltreat is a uh, conference that's held in upstate New York. It is a conference that is developed, organized, put on, and conducted by people who have autism. And tippies like myself to be able to go pretty much we have to be invited we have to be invited by one of the by one of the leadership or one of the coordinators and so um, Scott and I are hoping to be able to present a lot of the information that he and I are, are continue to develop uh, at Autry and I think that especially the the uh, family members and the and the individuals there will find it relevant to the to the set of circumstances they have now you know, one of the things that that can become that that becomes very frustrating to a person that's on the on the spectrum, is the 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 recognition of of well, let's, let me back up. What becomes significant is the fact that they that they first of all want to be recognized for who they are, and not necessarily for what they are. And this is an this is a driving set of of dialogue that's among the the group of persons who uh, are on the spectrum. And I'm not only talking about persons that are verbal that can express this. It, it it seems to be one of those things where people have other ways of communicating, communicate very clearly that they concern themselves about people identifying what they are as opposed to who they are. And so um, one of my other friends told me that as she was growing up. She said that she was always sort of 
sort of identified that she had a sibling, but she was always identified uh, after they were, they were, their names were given, this is my child who is autistic. And of course we don't really, you know, um, we, we don't do that really, but we have a tendency to identify because it gives an explanation for certain behaviors sometimes. And so we feel like we have to give an excuse for the behaviors, and, and so that name sort of says that's why the behavior is there. And so she said that, that as she grew older, she actually began to resent the fact that that was an identifier. Um, she said, uh, you have to really know Georgie to appreciate, she said, she said that's like somebody telling me that I'm a, a flaming, bald-headed redhead. She said, that just makes no sense. And so it made no sense to me that I had to be identified by that way. Um, you know, so, so one of the things that I think that as, as we begin to see some of the trends that are happening in autism, we, we really had a strong focus on the idea that we need to find things like cures and resolutions for behaviors and things like this. And the self-advocacy community is very concerned by the fact that, that people view them as somebody who needs to be cured and fixed as opposed to someone that needs to be understood and supported. And so as we work through this with self-advocates, we're beginning to have a different dialogue now with people that are on the spectrum because they see themselves as simply somebody that is unique and needs to be understood, needs to be supported. That's not unlike any of us, that we see ourselves as a unique person with our own personality, with our own likes and dislikes, and we see that we need to be uh, treated with respect and supported. And so I don't have to tell you as family members that that's the way that you see your child. But one of the things that we, that we are ongoing constantly is working with other people in the community to see them the same way that we do and to support them the same way that we do and not see them as a, as a description but yet as the child for, or the adult for who they actually are. When uh, uh, last year when, when uh, Scott, Scott came down last summer um, and spent an extended period of time with me and my family. And one of the things that uh, was, was very interesting about, about Scott's, uh, by the way, he had only ventured into the South one time before. Now, he's a, he is a homegrown northerner. He very rarely has ventured south of, uh, you know, south of the Virginia line, so to speak. And so uh, when he came to the, the deep South, it was somewhat of a culture shock, not to mention the fact that we in the South use all types of uh, idioms and figures of speech and references and he was very confused by some of the ways that we just interact with each other uh, and you and I don't see it as being incredibly different even if we travel outside the South. He began to be very, very, uh, actually very interested in the way that we as Southerners interact with each other. And what makes that fascinating to me is, is that he turned it around and he says, you know, you Southerners need to be understood and supported because we don't really understand what you're saying sometimes. And uh, for example, he asked me, he said, in the South, you're always preparing to do things. And I said, well, everybody prepares to do things. And he says, yeah, but you find it, re you find it a responsibility to tell people that you're about to do something. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you're always saying, we're fixing to go to the store. We're fixing to do this. And he said, I finally figured out that fixing has nothing to do with fixing anything. It's preparing. It's your substitute word for preparing. And I don't understand why you find the need to tell somebody that you are about to do something. That makes no sense to me. Um, and as I begin to think about it, I really have no explanation for that either. But, but it, it is little things like that that someone that has the observation skills of, of my friend Scott that we take for granted that becomes part of the complicated issue about how they need to be supported and how they need to be sort of, um, sort of coached along but at the same time not necessarily fixed. And, and you know, uh, uh, Scott certainly sees his, uh, himself as now a, a student of Southern language. I sent him a, a dictionary of Southern speaking language and, he said he's got it committed to memory. He's going to be coming back uh, next month to spend about two weeks with me and my family. So I think one of the things that we, that we sometimes don't think about in autism is that if we begin to look around other things, like in this case, a cultural difference, th that's not dissimilar in many ways than the culture of, a, of an individual who has autism. And there is definitely a culture within that, within that group of individuals. A culture that is 
uh, if you've ever spent much time around a lot of adults with autism, um, you'll begin to find out that they're, that they're very culturally aware of the fact that they are alike but different, but alike and different from other people that are around them. And so that's, that's something that, that this, this self-advocacy uh, group has begun to celebrate is their differences and their, and their even as Scott says, even my eccentricities, um, those are parts of what makes me who I am. And like I said, he's a PhD student. He just defended his proposal. Uh, it wasn't easy. We finally got to that point and got through that. Uh, but he defended that proposal. Now we're going to begin to collect data and, um, and, and work toward finishing that PhD up. And he's going to then... Uh, hopefully find a job in research. He wants to be a research design person, and uh, I think he'll do exactly that. One of the other things, too, though, I think, is that there are, there are certainly certain um, public pressures in the autism community to, to, I guess, follow certain trends is the right way to say. You know, we think about treatment always having to have a, an outcome of a cure, so to speak, or we think of treatment as having to have an outcome of some other type of resolution uh, um, status, so to speak. And, and that's certainly what we should, we should shoot for, but I think one of the things that, that some of the treatments that are out there now begin to do is they begin to be a little bit too harsh in trying to program the individual to become something that the treatment program says the outcome should be as opposed to what the individual should be. And so there's a lot of discussion about that across this country right now, about how certain kids that go through certain types of programs are very, very similar and behavior and language delivery and all these kinds of things and that's becoming concerning now to a certain group of uh, to a large group of professionals out there so uh, it, it's going to be very interesting to see as we move forward because autism is as, as a profession is still in its intimacy uh, in, infancy if you think about it because um, even though we certainly have had individuals who have been on the spectrum for a long time, we really only consider it a field of study for a very short period of time. Now, how long that is, I'm not real sure. Like I said, I've, I've got two decades plus, and you know, 20-something years ago when I would say that, that my field of interest is autism, I would have colleagues that say, why? There's like three of those people. I mean, wh why would you spend your whole life studying three or four people? Well, that was never the case, but people were that sort of off base about what autism was and was becoming and how it's, it was ultimately defining itself. One of the other issues that has to do with the uh, kind of an autism update, and this is still part of this conversation that I've already mentioned about, about the uh, self-advocacy movement and the internalization of these new things, is that um, we are beginning to the, uh, actually close in on a conversation, and you probably uh, have seen some of this conversation with the APA, is that it looks like diagnostically we're going to be moving away from terms such as PDD-NOS and Asperger syndrome, and as opposed to it becoming more of an autism spectrum disorder uh, as, a, as a diagnosis and beginning to identify the specific areas of focus that needs to happen for an individual. In other words, the intensity of some of the uh, areas that, that programs need to focus on as opposed to saying, okay, here's a person who has Asperger syndrome and we're going to put them in this program or this person has more classic autism and this is a more appropriate program. That seems to be more based on a diagnostic category as opposed to a true picture of what uh, areas that they are most challenged in. That conversation in the APA right now has been drug out for a long time. Um, the, the newest um, uh, draft that was put out actually does fold some of the other things into autism and move some uh, terminology completely out. Asperger's, for instance, is one of them. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see where that lands. Have you, have you seen some of that conversation? Yeah, I haven't read the actual text, but I've yeah. seen a debate about it. It's, a, it, it's, it's been pretty uh, intense discussion because um, if you get into the folks that are in, the, in diagnostics, uh, many folks see a need to try to still have these categorical identifiers. But when you get into the, the more global issues, and especially with the self-advocates, they actually see some of those terms as creating a, and I'm going to use this as a quote, as a caste system in and among persons who have autism. And because it's not really fair, and I know that, that this has been said many, many times by many, many professionals and many, many people, that it's not really fair to say that a person who has Asperger syndrome has a high-functioning form of autism. That's not a fair assessment for the individual. 
And let me give you an example why. If we say that high functioning, if we describe that as high functioning, we have a tendency as a society to clump a whole bunch of skills into saying this is high functioning, meaning that they have good language and they can read and they can do a variety of other different things that we assume are part of a high functioning set of criteria. The problem with that is, and I'll use Scott again with, as, as my ex example. Scott has wonderful skills. He can read, he can comprehend, he can organize certain, uh, certain thoughts, and he can organize certain uh, processes, but his executive functioning skills, which means that he can universally organize that information, which includes simple things like organizing a suitcase to pack and go somewhere, organizing his own set of schedule to make sure that he's that he's actually, he's very compulsive about certain things, but other things get lost in the schedule. So things that he needs to be doing as an adult get lost into some things that he wants to be doing because they're part of his compulsive routine. So his executive functioning skills really fail him. Part of that is, pro I mean, that's very problematic for him because what that means is some of the things that he really needs to be able to do to function more um, in a more cr at a critical level with certain things he really doesn't get and so he doesn't he never describes himself as a high functioning person with autism even though scott's iq uh, that's been tested is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 145 i mean he's not by any means uh, if we think about iqs that's a whole different set of categories or a whole different discussion so, so it's not really fair in their eyes to say this is high functioning, this is low functioning. What it says is, is this is a person that's on the spectrum and these are the challenges that this person is mostly facing that they need supports in order to move forward. Now I do know that the conversation, uh, especially among family members, there's been a lot, of, um, a lot of frustration and even some anxiety about the term Asperger syndrome going away because it, th there is a, a tendency to hold on to that as a diagnosis because it seems to, for many people, have, they've read into it that it implies a better outcome. Well, that's not fair either because we have instances of where many people that have all types of autism actually have very good outcomes, but we also have a large number of folks that are in all of these different categories that don't have such strong outcomes. But what we do know is that one of the things that affects that is the types and the amount and the intensity of the supports that that person gets in moving forward in their life as opposed to what the diagnosis actually is. And so it's going to be, it's, it's a very uh, precarious time right now in the autism community when it comes to the, the uh, terminology and classification as opposed to the, the uh, attitudes and, and opinions of self-advocates and families. And so it's really kind of a kind of an interesting balance. Uh-huh. Because mine was just diagnosed highly high functioning, uh -huh. and when I looked it up, because I'm just learning about it, they said it's not an official diagnosis. It's not a diagnosis. It never has been. Confuses me yeah. that you know here he is supposed to be high functioning, but he's only delayed in two or three areas. Right. So it just threw him over to be mm -hmm. in the high functioning, and right. he's got a lot of sensory. And I, I was reading a book that they gave me, the OT gave me and it said that you can be sensory and not be on the spectrum that's right so that that's what it's guess, very confusing yeah what pushes him over to that category yeah well usually that the, the traditionally the way that that term has been used not necessarily universally but 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 broadly the hfad which is not a true diagnosis um has been used to say that the, the individual typically falls somewhere into what the criteria for Asperger says, but they don't meet all the criteria for more classic autism. So they're somewhere right in the middle of that. Well, that's not a fair representation of it either. And so it gets to be extremely confusing. And yes, there are sensory integration uh, dysfunctions that any person can have. Probably, you know, um, they can be acquired or they can be uh, uh, onset at birth, you know. Um, so, so that's not a fair assessment to say, well, he has sensory problems, so that puts him on the spectrum. Or that a child that has other types of neurological involvement, say, for instance, epilepsy or something like that, that and they might self-stem to say, well, that's epilepsy and autism. The stemming may be simply because of the neurological involvement, not necessarily because it's autism. So it's very, it's very confusing. It's very complicated when you get into the, as they say, in the weeds of how that 
diagnosis has occurred. And so we see often, we'll see a diagnosis. I keep pointing to you because I know you see all these things too. We see a, we see a, a diagnosis quite often that looks like a, um, it actually looks like a, a chart of diagnosis that are paired to a behavior but not necessarily representative of a true diagnosis. So we'll see a kid sometimes that, I see kids all the time that have a diagnosis of seven and eight different diagnoses. Well, that's not practical. And what, what you'll, when you get into the weeds of the whole thing, you begin to find out that a diagnosis was given because there was a certain behavior that was documented, and that behavior is described by that diagnosis. When in truth, globally, the diagnosis really is autism spectrum disorder. Um, and so that's part of that's trying to that's what's trying to, to form itself out. That that might be really helpful, I think, for some of the families yeah. to flesh out a little bit. Just okay. Because I think a lot of times that happens where they'll say, "Well, you have autism and ADHD, mm -hmm. or your son has autism and OCD." Right. And I think the OCD and the ADD is part of the at autism and. That's right. It's so a descriptor. It's, it's a yeah. behavioral descriptor. Like we'll see kids that have, and, and I think about think about your child as I go through this, and your child may either may either fit this or not, uh, but at times they will fit it, okay? For instance, we'll see a, a, a child that will have a, a diagnosis of autism or Asperger's syndrome, because that is a true diagnostic category right now. And then they'll also have a, a diagnosis as ADHD. And most kids are on the spectrum have attention deficit issues. That's just a given. That's a feature of the, of the autism. Uh, obsessive compulsive behaviors, that's pretty much a kind of a feature of, of, most, of most of the kids or adults, um, even oppositional defiant disorder. Well, uh, you know, kids on the spectrum are very defiant, not because they're choosing to be defiant or they're direct, directly defiant, but because behaviorally they're defiant, sometimes they get that label as well too. You get other diagnoses that'll be personality disorder types of ones, and you're thinking, well, a person, you know, that's not making eye contact and not really connected to other people, they have a personality disconnect because there's a social component to it. Um, you, we get, uh, I, I saw a, a diagnosis not too long ago that a child, this is a kid now 12 years old, had a diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder. Uh, and he was a very boisterous, very seemingly arrogant kid if you didn't really get, you know, really talk to him a lot because he knew a lot of stuff. He knew a lot of stuff. And if you didn't know what he knew, he wanted you to know it. And if you knew something that wasn't necessarily consistent with what he knew, he would correct you about it. And so somebody labeled him with narcissistic personality disorder. Well, that's not accurate. That's simply part of the feature again. So we're seeing, we're seeing this uh, as part of it. Um, part of the complicating problem, though, is, and this is, this is a system issue, is that those diagnoses quite often are reimbursable through uh, insurance schedules and Asperger and autism quite often are completely denied through reimbursement um, through or your insurance reimbursement. So that's complicated the issue as well too. They'll describe, you'll see those kind of descriptors so that the insurance company will pick some of those things up. Should never be that way. Stay with the school system. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, so that's part of this, this difficulty. And so now, yeah, I guess the, the thing that, that always fascinates me about my friends is that you, sh you, you said it very, very uh, wonderfully. It's just really confusing. Well, my friends that are on the spectrum are really confusing too because all of a sudden they're trying to identify with all this language when really all they want is to be understood and supported. And, and you know, that, so, so you can understand now how if it's complicated to families, part of that family member is that, that individual. And so it's, it's equally, maybe doubly as confusing to them to try to sort that out. And so, you know, the question often is then with this complicated issues, well, do I tell my child that, they're, that they have autism? Do I tell my child they have Asperger's syndrome? And um, my response to that typically is this, and this is, again, shared to me by a lot of adults, that I, and I've asked that exact question. Uh, when were you told, and do you wish you were told earlier? And without, without any hesitation, the ones that are told later in life say, you know what, I always knew I was different. I always felt uh, certain ways about other people around me and how they had reacted to me. And when I realized that the way that was happening, or why it was happening, actually had a name, and I wasn't the only person like that, that helped me so much to begin to move forward and learn about myself. And so I think it's important that we, that we um, don't just try to shield 
the individual by not telling them. We need to work through those differences to make sure that they that they also begin to appreciate their own differences. So, uh -huh. but you also hear people say, "Don't slap the label yeah. on them," yeah, and because people will tend to play to that label. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, pe other people play to that 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 label. Yeah. 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 Well, a doctor that would refuse to um, diagnose their son as autistic mm -hmm. for a long time for yeah. that reason. For, for can't so, label, so, label. so as not to label them. Yeah. Well, but but the way starting I'm, at three years old, though, is, is, is my concern. Though mm -hmm. he's so young, and it's, it's so hard to tell what's a three-year-old. Right. Just not interested right now in certain activities, so that makes him he's not social. Right. Well, I tell you what, our goal as professionals in the field is is that, and this seems to be counterintuitive. So when I say this. Uh, I want you to realize that I know that what I'm about to say sounds counterintuitive, okay? Um, we, our hopes are is to identify a child as absolute early as possible. Because if we can identify those sets of traits and those sets of behaviors, those sets of challenges as early as we can and get the right types of interventions in place, our goal, our ultimate goal is, is that when, as they move forward, at some point they are undistinguishable from their typical peers. So even though we may identify a child very young, Dr. Ron Melmed in Arizona, and I have had these conversations, he's a wonderful, he's a physician, he gets it, and, he, um, and we've had these conversations that even though there may be a diagnosis at a very young age, the real proof is whether or not you can pick that kid out among other kids ultimately as you move forward. And so I have a tendency to agree with him on that because if we wait and that wait also includes we're waiting to start that aggressive types of intervention and treatments, then we're wasting a lot of time because we're waiting on a name. If giving the name starts the treatment and the intervention right, then let's get it going. And then let's, let's make as much of that as indistinguishable as we can, but not negate the fact that it's still, you know, that it's still there. You know, uh, many of y'all are familiar with our, our Camp Kaleidoscope program. Your son's, uh, you know, he's a, he's a, a pro at it. Um, well, by the way, I saw Sid Salter the other day, and he said if I, if I, I saw y'all to tell y'all hello. So um, uh, her, her son is a, now a radio celebrity. So we, we, we're doing, with team, we're doing a number of uh, remotes through Super Talk all across the state. And Tyler was up there. He, I want to be on the radio. I want to talk on the radio. And so Sid Salter, who is one of the personalities, let him come up there and he talked to him, and it was great. It was it was just it was really good. Dennis and and uh, Tyler were up there, and they they did a great job. Um, but uh, you know, at, at Camp Kaleidoscope, one of the things that that I hear over and over among the this is children saying this now. These are children sharing these ideas. Is I, I'm not the only person like this. I made a new friend. His name is Matthew. And he's just like me. We like the same stuff. We like to talk to each other. You know, we stayed up late last night. I've never stayed up late with somebody like that before. I mean, if you think about the fact that, uh, that how you and I identify with people that you and I identify with, it is on a common ground. And so that common ground for a person with autism is very important to them. And so uh, we hear kids at camp all the time that say, wow, he's, he's like me. He's just like me. That's really cool. And so uh, that tells me a strong piece of information about how, a, 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 and these are children, our camp is for 7 to 17. Um, they, they're looking for not only their own identity, but an identity that they relate to somebody else that, you know, that, that, that means something. That's actually a meaningful connection uh, with someone. And this is, we see this even though the kids that are nonverbal don't verbalize that, we see those bonds begin to build because they're very connected. And even though they may not be connected eye to eye and doing some things that, uh, that we think of traditional interactions with kids, there's no doubt that their connection begins to get very, very strong just in the course of just three days. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the reasons why uh, you know, uh, Julie was talking about my work with IDS, and most of y'all are familiar with my work with TEAM. Uh, that's one of the reasons why TEAM has made, the Board of Directors has made a firm commitment, and firm to the point to where we already have started, but where we're going to build our own retreat center for persons who, 
uh, that are on the spectrum and their typical peers for all ages, not just 7 to 17. And this retreat center will be involved with having uh, weekends that will be focused on socialization skills mixed in there with fun. Actually, it's fun mixed in with socialization skills, to be quite honest with you, because one of the things that we're seeing with all of our programs is that that interaction, that strong connection, and that ability to express yourself, who you are, where you are, when you are, uh, is very, very, uh, it's very therapeutic, even though it doesn't look like therapy. It's very therapeutic. At the end of camp last year, I, uh, I got a call from a parent, and it didn't start out the way you want a call to start. She said, I want to know what you did to my son. And I thought, oh, okay. I said, well, maybe you don't want to tell me what's going on, and I'll see if we can walk you through it. He, she said, for the first time ever, I went to the grocery store. I didn't have to drag him screaming out of the van. He went into the grocery store, got the shopping list, and said, Mom, what can I help you get? And was talking to people in the grocery store saying, Hey, my name is Matthew. We'll say Matthew. Uh, we're having carrots for supper. What are you having for supper tonight? What are you here? She said he's never done that before. He's never approached people in the grocery store. He's never interacted. He's never tried to be a part of what was going on. And I have a different kid. So what did you do to him? Well, all we did to him was give him the confidence to be you know, out there and not be so stifled and so intimidated by the world out there because he's, for the first time in his life, has spent three nights and the bigger part of four days away from his family and all of a sudden it was like you know I can do this is this world thing's not so big it's not so bad and he was engaging and is still engaging and so again because it doesn't look like therapy doesn't mean it's not therapeutic I mean that is very that is very strong in building self-esteem and so that's why the team board has made a commitment to build this retreat center. it's called the, the Center Ridge Outpost our first project will be to have tree houses uh, where the kids can come and adults too. I like to sleep in one of the tree houses we're building, and uh, they all and they're not really built in trees, by the way. They're on stilts and and uh, they share a common uh, a deck and everything. But um, you know we'll have those kinds of programs. We'll eventually have the whole the whole thing out there so that we can do things all summer long. You know most uh, you know most weekends we'll have different things going on. During, you know my kids go to church camp for instance after Christmas before New Year's. Well. I want, uh, you know, our, our camp kids that have been with us for a long time and kids that have never been, I want them to have the same opportunity. And so that's one of the reasons why we've committed to, uh, to building this outpost. Um, and then we'll uh, also make sure that uh, our neurotypical peers are out there and a part of it as well, too. I mean, that's, that's an important part of how that works. So it's a, it's a fascinating process when you see a child like that among so many different children with autism. Uh, and so many different types of autism, and they're not all don't, don't have different names. Well, actually, they do have different names. It's, you know, it's Kylie and Matthew and you know and and Tyler, and now they do have different names. But it has nothing to do with their autism. It has to do with who they are. And the thing that that bonds them together is this this thing that we call autism. And it's really fascinating to see how they figure out how that that's a productive part of who they are and not necessarily something that, that people have a tendency to label to be uh, you know, such, a, such a problem. Um, but that's not to say that the, some of the challenges that, that you as parents face and as your children are facing right now, that doesn't mean that they're not insurmountable at this time too. I mean, it takes a lot of, a, a lot of sort of alternative uh, understanding about how to proceed with some of the things that are going on. It doesn't mean that you can accept everything doesn't mean that you should accept all the behaviors, obviously, but it does mean that, that they have a different thing that motivates them. My friend Scott, for instance, when he was a, a, a younger adult, he began to realize that he was suffering from very acute depression. And that depression was is because it, when, as he moved further along in his life, the support systems that, that had begun to, that, that developed around him, uh, as he was growing up, his parents and friends that were close by, other family members, as he moved away from them, the whole support network just suddenly vanished. And so he really had deep, deep battles with depression and still does. Um, and interestingly enough, as he goes back home, the support network as it was is not the same anymore. Some people have either moved on, the relationship is different, they don't see him on a daily basis. Um, as he says, many of them say, well, Scott's working on his Ph.D. There's nothing we really, I mean, he's just, he's a Ph.D. student. But he's still challenged by a variety of things, some of them not much different than it was just a few years ago, 
when he was needing their support, he still needs that support. And they have a tendency now to have switched gears and they're not thinking about him in the same need area um, and certainly not adjusting to some of his, his uh, newer needs that have developed, especially like the depression and stuff. So it's, a, it, it's, it's one of those things that, that is an internal, it's an invisible part of autism because, like I said, even though some of those behaviors have a tendency to dissipate or they have a tendency to shift or they just disappear, doesn't mean that some of the internal mechanisms that were motivating those behaviors, that it's gone as well too. The behavior may be manifesting itself in a different way. A good example, and this is a very global type of example, is a kid that covers his ears. And as they get older, that they, they develop all types of defense mechanisms that doesn't inc- they, they begin to realize that this makes them stand out. And you may see them do different things, like just simply turning their head or moving away or repositioning themselves. Or, or, uh, you know, if you've never done this, and, and one of the things, my, sometimes my wife thinks that I need some kind of clinical assessment too because I'll see a kid doing something, and when I get, you know, by myself, I'll a lot of times go, okay, now, what does that feel like? What are they doing? And I'll try to replicate it because I want to see what it does. And it, it's amazing that if somebody's talking to you, if you'll simply just step behind somebody else, how much difference that makes, that simple act in the modulation of the voice that's coming at you. That's a very subtle, but a very mild, but a very functional behavior that doesn't make somebody stand out if they're covering their ears as much as if they just simply position themselves to the side. And you'll see kids that'll move their ear, especially their very hyper acute ear away from and keep the ear that they tolerate sounds. They, They do some very interesting things. So what we have a tendency to think is that, well, this is gone now, and so, his ears must be adjusting, or her ears might, must be adjusting. Not necessarily so. What's happening is, is the mechanisms that they're using to modulate have become more sophisticated. They've become a little bit more aware of, of how they're making themselves stand out, and they'll modulate their behavior to modulate what it is that's, uh, that's being sort of distressing to them. And so sound is one of those things that you'll see. The behavior will mature, but at the same time, the function of what they're doing still is... is uh, is accomplishing the same thing. So we would have a tendency to say, thank goodness his ears are doing much better. Uh, that may not be the case. Yeah, so, uh-huh. That starts pretty early, too. It can. It can. He turns seven, mm-hmm. and like in the mornings, he has to make a bathroom stop at a certain service station. Uh-huh. And he always gets behind me when we walk in. Mm-hmm. And I never really thought about that. I thought that was part of the shyness, but it might have been... Could be a variety of things. Mayor, and not only that, if he hears the sound, you know, like most children with autism, a mm-hmm. commercial toilet being flushed, mm-hmm. you know how loud it sure, is. Sure, sure. And I'm probably, and I'm losing my hearing as I get older. You know, I can do that. Yeah. And he's probably hearing that sound as we walk in the door. Sure. And I'm. Could be a variety of things. Yeah. And that's why he's probably doing. It could be a variety of different things. Yeah. You know, one of the things that we watch when we watch the kids at camp, of course. Now, you know. You can't be in, in the profession that I've been in for as long as I've been in and not just by some secondary, uh, I guess, nature become a, a student of human behavior. I mean, I'm just, I, I literally become consumed with human behavior. Sometimes, it's, I guess it's sort of my OCD because I really get really very consumed with watching behavior and never more so than at camp. I mean, I, when, it, and when I'm at camp, I watch kids and how they are interacting, how they're behaving, how they're modulating, how they're doing certain things. And one of the things that we, that we, uh, that's very interesting is that, of course, we have kids in an environment that are not very often in. They're hot, they're sweaty, they're around people that are hot and sweaty, and then many times they're new to them. And so hot and sweaty people also add up together to be sometimes stinking people. And then you add the swimming pool smells in there and the sounds of a swimming pool and you you know then we and then we also are so bold as to have a fireworks show you know and a lot of families are like oh, i can't believe y'all are going to shoot fireworks absolutely we're trying to we're, we're trying to send that kid home to where the next time somebody says there's a fireworks show after the baseball game you can stay and watch the fireworks show because we've we've introduced that now that's that's one of the things that we try to do with these programs and so we watch that behavior, and as I'm watching behavior, the very subtle things that these kids do to modulate their environment is absolutely some of the most sophisticated behaviors that you'll ever see. And the reason it's so sophisticated, in is because 
it is it is done not necessarily because it's an intentional behavior it is a behavior that's done in order to modulate something that's bigger than you and I can 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 manage a certain behavior it's bigger than what we can actually teach a person because they're doing it in response to something that's very direct as opposed to you and I are actually trying to teach something which means we're introducing it secondarily whereas they're reacting primarily to it so their behavior to modulate is is almost like a survival instinct that they develop in on themselves so if you'll watch the behaviors it's really very sophisticated some of the things that they'll that they'll do here's a good example um, do, do any of your kids like to have their head rubbed a lot of kids on the spectrum they'll grab somebody's head and they want you to rub their head you know they'll grab their hand and they want you to rub their head and so that's a behavior that we see very very often at uh, at camp, and so as we've watched this over the years, something we we begun to realize a few things. For many kids, it is a sign saying, "I'm tired, I'm sleepy," and that's something that, believe it or not, we think in the kids that we observe at camp is almost a behavior. Whereas if somebody would rub my head, I'm going to go to sleep. It's a behavior they're trying to engage to actually not go to sleep. They don't want to disengage from everything. So you'll see them trying to make that interaction and they'll, they'll have their head rubbed. With some other kids like that, it's a sure sign that something's going on, like a headache, sunburn, or something like that. But that, even though they have words, sometimes these behaviors are the more solid, reliable pieces of information because they may not be able to, to connect with what it is that they're actually trying to say, but that behavior becomes very strong. And so that's, a pretty, that's, that's kind of just one example, this head rubbing. We see a lot of kids that do that. It, and it is sensory. But at the same time, it is functional in some really kind of interesting and unique ways. We, you know, um, we have kids, for instance, that and many kids with, on the spectrum don't like to wear caps. Well, on the packing list for Camp Kaleidoscope, it always says cap. And we always have a, a whole list of families that call and say, my kid won't wear a cap. And then they come back to pick up their kid who's sporting a cap, and they're like, how did that happen? But they, he never wears a hat. Well, the reason that it happened is because the entire, um, the entire necessity and the support of you need to wear that cap was persistent because we don't want them to get sunburned. And we have parents all the time says, my child won't drink water. Yeah, they'll drink water, and they do. And because we keep that water, we've got to keep them hydrated. We're not going to flush sodas down them, so they're going to drink water, and they all do. And we have families all the time that say, you know, we thought that that would carry over when they got back home, and... He won't drink water, but he comes to camp. He drinks water. And, you know, drinks drinks lots of water. So, so there are certain uh, unseen things too that are motivated by the be, by the environment. That means that the behavior is either um, it's either acceptable in in an environment and not acceptable in another environment. So they modulate behavior that says, "My child will not do this," but you put them in this environment over here, and they absolutely will do it. But does it carry back to home? No, not necessarily. And so that begins to still show us that this unseen part of autism is not always so solid, rock solid, it's going to be this way. It still is very conditional between the environments and the different things that are available in that environment and things they need to, they need to uh, begin to have this sophisticated modulation behavior that they engage in, and they are very adaptable to it. We have kids that come to camp a lot of times and they'll say, well, he'll only eat this, this, and this. And then we report back and, you know, if they're not on one of the special diets or something, uh, he ate ravioli and, uh, you know, ate broccoli and, what? No, not, no, he didn't eat broccoli. Oh, we got it on film. Yes, sir, we got it. He ate broccoli. So, uh, again, that's not to say that, that the home is not doing what it's supposed to. It's that the environment presents a different set of circumstances. And they, and they actually are more resilient than we, than we quite often think. So I think one of the things that, I, that, that Scott and I are hoping with the message about the internal portions of autism is to try to make people realize that, that you know, the stigma that comes along with a child with autism that says, well, that's a child that's misbehaving, that needs a good spanking, that needs some more discipline, all that stuff is just wrong. And what we really need to do is begin to make people realize that the behavior is simply an outward expression of something that you and I can't see. It's, it's something that you and I may be, be fortunate enough to realize, but it is not 
what the behavior says it is. It's something else, and the behavior is simply the, the display of something else that's this puzzle that we've got to put together back here. This is just what we can see. These are the real issues. And in the behavioral world, we call those antecedents to that behavior. And many times in a traditional behavioral uh, uh, scheme, we really think that most cases there's a antecedent to a behavior. And what we begin to realize in the autism world, there's a, there is a, this combination of antecedents that sort of merge together at this, in this bizarre kind of set of, uh, of instances to create a certain behavior that makes it more difficult to, to draw apart because it's not just connected to the dots. It's really quite exponential when we look at some of the things that the effect has. Um, and so that makes it much, much more complicated. Which means that for you as parents, when you go to a clinician and you're trying to explain this to a, a doctor or a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a teacher or somebody like that, that's why you sound to them kind of quacky. Because, because you know what you're saying. You understand the complexity of what balled up to make your child behave a certain way. You get that. They don't get it because in most cases, those professionals are actually trained to be more linear in thought. And this whole notion about these things coming together, and it's kind of like a, a reverse ex atom explosion. It's like everything comes together to shoot forward as opposed to coming out here and then dispersing. And, and you get that, and they're thinking linear, whereas you, where you're collectively thinking about all the things that is your child and what that effect has. You get that, and it's hard to make other people understand that, which is why I've always said it's a lot of times if professionals would just sit down, hush, and listen to the families, they, they can begin to help that family put the picture together because the thing that they may not know is all of the things that autism is and isn't. It's confusing. But what they do know is they know their child. They get their child. They know what, what makes their child tick. They know what makes their child shut down. They know all the things that is their child. And if you'll listen to those pieces, that's the antecedents to where it is that this observable behavior brings that child to. And so uh, it is unfortunate that, we have, that, that many professions do think real linear. We have, this has to cause this. This has to cause this. And it's not that simple in the world of autism. We really have to, we really have to change that paradigm for professionals to think in a different way about kids with autism. There is, no other, there is no other disability like autism when it comes to the complexity of understanding how those clusters occur. I'm, I'm convinced of that. And I've worked, I've worked in the psychiatric field for a long, long time when I worked for the Department of Mental Health. Um, you know, and, and I can tell you, there is, there is nothing more complicated than this whole process that we're trying to sort out. The benefit of having people like my friend Scott and Georgie and, and Temple Grandin that, most, that I'm sure all of y'all have heard of, but having conversations with people like Temple and Scott give people like me the benefit of getting inside of autism and trying to say, okay, this is how these clusters work and this is, how you, this is what you were dealing with. Now, the problem with that is, is that when you talk to Temple, you get one set of hints that has nothing to do with anything that's relevant to Scott sometimes. So, so there, is not a, there is not a global transference of understanding between each person, but it does give us a very broad understanding of how those things uh, actually may work and how they may not work in some cases too. So, um, so, so as you're talking to people about your child, that's one of the things that I'm, I'm beginning to tell families is as you're beginning to do this, try to make the people out there that don't get it, get it by that understanding that that what you're seeing is not really the issue. It's all the other pieces that make that happen that really are the issue. Those are the pieces we're trying to, that we're trying to help put together so that this can be either to an acceptable level or it can be to a tolerable level, not only just for families, but for the individual themselves. And so we need to really get folks to think differently about how those clusters create something that uh, we, we have a tendency to spend too much time on the absolute behavior as opposed to all this other stuff that's going on. All right, questions. Let me shut up and listen to questions or comments or um, things that you might have. What you were just saying that the mm -hmm. last, what you were talking about, mm -hmm. um, one of the, when they observed him in the room at the IDS building, Dr. Siders and them, right. um, one of the little situations they put him in was to see how affectionate he was with a baby doll. Mm -hmm. Well, 
I guess that's his parent. He doesn't play with baby dolls. Right. Now he knows if I start crying or if he hurts, if he's too rough when he's, you know, in really sensory and, you know, and I pretend like I'm crying, he'll right. go, oh, it's okay, mommy, it's okay. You know, he, he is lovable. And if the dog, you know, and I said, no, you hurt sissy, you know, love sissy. And he'll, mm. oh, it's okay, sissy. Right. You know? But for the baby doll, he was, because he didn't feed her. <laughs> at a loss, way, at an absolute loss, like, sure. Okay, well, he's just, you know, they, they marked that down. And in my report, it was that he wasn't, he wasn't sensitive to other, mm -hmm. you know, just I, kind of above my head, but just, I guess right. I felt like you were saying, well, no, that's not why he's not doing right. that. It's because right. he doesn't, he's not, he doesn't relate to Well, and see, and that, now. and that's a, that's a good example right there about how many of the testing tools that we use are not real effective in helping us identify some of the, some of the components to a, a, per, a person who has autism. For instance, the example that you gave really is less about uh, about connecting in a, in, a, in, a, in a compassionate way as opposed to his inability to regulate role playing because that's a role playing yeah. but so so if you look at the criteria for autism you see that part of that down there says you know the inability to, to role play yeah. so so it's more about about that as opposed but when, when a lot of folks that as we look at the traditional application of many of the assessments because they've been normed on groups that have nothing to do with autism and you know the, it, we're getting better um the ados I, well, i'm trying to think which one they do you remember which one they, they use um i'm just now getting into that part of, yeah was it the ados um name some more i might um, um abels ados it's probably the ados so. yeah so the ados really and truly is they're trying to see how he can role play and so but if we yeah yeah. Is a bit, you know, I never really did that with them. Exactly, I mean, and that, that's what I was going to say. That, I didn't that, push that. Exactly, and that's what I was going to say is that kids with autism are they actually are, are they're they're very uh, tunnel visioned when it comes to experiences that they that they generalize, and so if that's something that's never been exposed to, mm -hmm. the fact that he's not going to react to it in a an appropriate way and that's that's I don't really like right, that term right. but 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 it, it, it's slim to none because it's so specific that it's going to be slim to none that it's going to occur and so those te those assessments are they're they're getting better and as we begin to understand more and more about autism even the ADOS which is an autism specific one there's a lot of things that are being discussed even about it that that's sending miscues and stuff for for people that are giving that test so it's it's a developing field as we begin to understand it. The, what's more important is that you as a, as a, as a mom recognize that you know, he didn't react that way because, well, he's never, situationally, he's never encountered that or never been, yeah. never, it's right. never been facilitated. I'm looking at it the other way. Like that, you just that's exactly right. Explained it to me. That's right. That's exactly right. And so we, we've got to get better at that. We really do. We, we've got to, uh, we've got to understand that, uh, that as we're talking to these individuals that share so much information with us, we need to use that wealth of information and apply it to these testing instruments as well too, so that they're less, well, they, they have more input from persons that really get it from the inside out as opposed to us observing from the outside in and how that balance is, is struck. Um, we've got a long way to go though yet, I'll be real honest with you, but we're getting there. It's a whole lot better the ADOS, that, that, that's probably what y'all went through, is a lot better than the CARS that's been used for how long? I, I mean, the CARS was, was first written in the 70s, I guess, maybe 74, 75. And it's, you know, the last question on that is, is do you think this child has autism? <laughs> that's what the whole purpose behind the thing was, to try to get to that point. Now, at the last question, it, it asked the parent, do you think your child has autism? Yeah. Well, no, I mean, no, that's not what we're, we're just here trying to find out what is, but no, that's not it. So it's a, yeah, it, we're, we're getting better at that, but we still have a long, a, lo a pretty good learning curve on it. But then again, um, IQ tests, they, we're still on the learning curve of those. And as a matter of fact, IQ tests are beginning to kind of fade in significance from what they were certainly in the 80s and in the early 90s. People don't look at IQ tests as saying this is the be-all like they used to in the 80s. It was, you know, if you had a, a, a just an average IQ, well, you know, college probably out of the question because you just have an average IQ. We know that not to be the case now. So, it, with uh, an example of that, Michael, I think they tested him. His overall IQ was like 86 last year or mm -hmm. something. This is a, a child who about a month ago, an elder friend of ours died, and he would always give her a gentle hug at church. He knew he couldn't hug her hard. He'd lay his head mm -hmm. on her chest, and when she passed away. 
went to the weight because, you know, as some of family members are dying, trying to prepare sure. him and somebody close would die, and his mom was crying. He says, it's okay, Mommy. She's in heaven with God, and she's like a baby again. Mm -hmm. What insight? I mean, nobody had told him that. And, and, of course, we know when we go to heaven, we're God, and we're, we are like a baby again. We have no needs, no worries. We're taken care of. Yeah. And he came up with that on his own. Well, but, he had an IQ of 86. Well, yeah, but, it, but, but if you got inside of that, that, that comment, and you could trace it all the way back. There, there is a beginning to that co that comment. He, he, at some point has has had the pieces of information to process that forward, or either he's heard it specifically and it's carried forward. Um, because one of the things that kids with autism are often accused of not doing is being able to have sympathy and empathy, and they really are. They kind of do stink it up. But what I'm finding finding out by working with my my friends is that it, it's it's it's, a, it's maybe an amplified uh, issue about what, what you and I may go through in grief. For instance, if um, uh, uh, let's just say, for instance, that we had a common friend that passed away that was very dear to both of us, but we knew that person in, in a different relationship in some way. The way that, that, that I would grieve may be very different in the way that she would grieve, and I, even to the point where she may find my grief unacceptable. I may decide that I'm going to go hang out and we're going to get out on the boat because that's what he always liked to do. We're going to get out there on the boat. We're going to fish and have a big old time. And she may think, well, that's an insult. You should be solemn. And you're out celebrating. You see, so grief process is a, is a weird thing anyway. And so when we stack in on top of this social disconnect of understanding sympathy and empathy, you can get some very mechanical responses to it. And that's what we see most of the time out of kids with autism. Does that mean that they, they don't have sympathy, like you said with the, the dog? Uh, no, they, but they do have to be taught through those set of, of behavioral responses, even though they may actually uh, have gotten it that they shouldn't have done that or that they should express a certain thing. They don't necessarily always do it very effectively. It's, it's sort of the delivery, not necessarily always the lack of understanding of it. But I'll, I'll, I'll share, a, 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 I have a, a real good friend of mine, lives here in Hattiesburg, and her father is, uh, is very, very ill right now. Very ill. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's gotten worse and worse, and now he's on a ventilator, and he's on dialysis, and it, it doesn't really look good. Her teenage daughter, who has Asperger's syndrome, her comment to me was is, I just I can't deal with that right now. I've got too much homework. I just cannot deal with all that right now. And that's that's how she's reacting to it. And this is her grandfather. And so that would seem to be that she's very empathetic. You know, she just has no empathy at all. The reality is, is that's part of her mechanism to deal with something that she's sort of not equipped to deal with as well, too. So it doesn't mean that it's inappropriate. It just comes across as being very inappropriate. She's transferring some energy that she may see as being sort of non-productive by grieving this set of circumstances into something else. So it's really, it's really kind of complicated when you get into some of the, especially the sympathy and empathy and questions about religion. And, and uh, I mean, I have kids all the time that say, you know, uh, I, I've, I've been asked this by a number of kids. So if God made us, who made God? And somebody had to. It just couldn't have just started. So somebody, somebody else is responsible for that. I don't know how to answer that. I've even asked a lot of theologians, okay, help me with that question. And they'll say, you know, I got nothing. Uh, I just I don't know how to tell you to break that down. I got nothing for you. So it's a, it's a very complicated process. And so you, it, if you could trace that back, it'd be fascinating to know where it comes from. So they probably just get bits and pieces. Bits and pieces. And they put it together. And could be. Or it could be an instant that he heard it at one point, and that's all. It, you didn't think it was ever, if he ever heard it, didn't think he ever saw it. Um, it. It's really pretty fascinating. They are a sponge. These kids are sponges, and everything that they encounter becomes part of them. And they, you may not see it, but at these weird opportune times, it presents itself, and you're going, where in the world did that come from? It came from some other connection somewhere that just hasn't surfaced at some point. Yeah, you've seen that song? Yeah, yeah if sure. I, if, if I get upset or, and I say, okay, that's it, we got to go, I'm too tired. Yeah. And that's what I say sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, like, yeah. I'm too tired to do this. And so he'll, he gets me back every now and then. Goes, I, I said, let's go, we got to go cut your hair. I'm too tired. Because he doesn't like his hair. Yeah, yeah, or yeah. He'll, he'll say, I don't feel good. Yeah. He'll tell me that because that's 
we, uh, we, we, you know, it's real fascinating the way that, that uh, these kids begin to sort of, um, how they begin to put pieces together of their world. And, and, and what you, you've already found out, I'm sure, I, I know that y'all have because I know your son so well. Uh, they'll take bits and pieces of what it is that, they're, that, that, that they know, and they know a lot, but they'll begin to put those pieces together because it's, it benefits their cause, so to speak. Does that sound familiar? So they're drawing from here and here and here, and they're like, no, it's because of this, and it's because he's trying to, or she's trying to support what it is or he or she wants to do. Now, that's not because they're lying, even though it may, there may be a few little white lies mixed in there. They honestly believe it to be the truth, but it's bits and pieces that they put together. And so uh, one of the kids, when we took, uh, we, we took a group of kids um, uh, hiking and camping, we had 20 kids, 12 kids were on the spectrum, 8 kids were just typical peers that were just right along with us. And we hiked about 5 miles, and at the end of the hike, we already had the trailer there, and we set up tents, and we, you know, we did everything you're supposed to do, cooking a campfire, and had marshmallows. Yep, we had a campfire. One of the mothers said, are y'all going to have a fire? Of course we're going to have a fire. Oh, I'm a little upset, I'm a little concerned about that. It'll be fine, it's just a fire. You know, it's not a forest fire, it's just a campfire. Um, so anyway, I was, I was telling, uh, before we started the hike, I was telling uh, the parents, uh, they were, one of the parents was saying, this is just great. We never thought that he would go on a hike in a camp trip. I mean, this is just, this is, we just can't wait to see how this turns out. And I was telling them that I had, was talking to some teachers, and I was telling them we were about to do this. And one of the teachers said, you know what, I got two kids with autism in my class. It's all I could do to make it through the day. What in the world makes you think you can take 12 on a hiking and camping trip? And my response was, and which is typically my notion about things, is, well, you know, it just never crossed my mind I couldn't. I mean, I just never thought of anything else except this is what we're going to go do. So, I, so this one of the kids that was on the hike heard that little exchange between me and, and this set of parents. So we were at the camp that night. We're sitting around the campfire, and he comes over to me, and he says, um... I think what we need to do is uh, uh, go to NASA in Florida. I was like, well, that would be kind of fascinating, but uh, that would be an expensive trip. That would be kind of hard to put together. He said, well, I think watching a rocket or seeing the rockets, that would be just fascinating, something like that. You know, he was really into the space stuff like that. I said, well, I don't know. I said, that'd be really expensive. I don't know if we could, uh, I don't know if we could uh, pull that off. He said, I never thought we couldn't. And I was like, oh, that came back to bite me. And so, you know, it, 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 I didn't think he was even listening. Well, when he said that, I was like, oh, I, okay, I know where that came from. And so we had to talk a little bit more about, we can, but here's, the, here's our obstacles, money, <laughs> travel, you know, just a variety of different things like that. So it's really amazing that sponge to the environment about how those things are acquired and stuff. So, um, and we've done a lot of things. We've, we've taken kids on camping trips and hiking trips and uh, shrimping trips and I mean we're, we're, we're committed to doing these things and, um, and and quite honestly it's things that a lot of uh, professionals and families are like oh, I don't know about that we took a, a group of kids to, to the uh, coast and we toured the Pascagoula River Basin and on that trip we had about 30 kids uh, and of those 30 kids about 19 of those kids had autism and um, there were a couple of parents like I, and these were these were families that had never their kids had never come to Camp Kaleidoscope where you see you know 60 kids with autism all at the same place they'd never seen more than three or four at the same place and they were they were standing there as they dropped them off like oh my goodness and you're really up for this huh I said it'll be fine it'll be fine and so we got in the boat and we toured for about two and a half hours in a boat um, all up and down the Pascagoula River Basin not one minute of behavioral problems. Now, when we hit dry ground, we had a few that we had to sort of decompress after the trip. But um, yeah, it was, uh, you know, it, it's one of those things where uh, I'm, I'm committed to the notion that, that we've got to make sure that everything every other kid's getting to do, that we provide those chances out there. I mean, I'm just committed to that because I think that, that to do otherwise is not fair. And um, just, just simply put, it's just not fair. Um, that's why we started Camp Kaleidoscope. I grew up as a boy going to Boy Scout camp. Every kid ought to get to go to camp. Or they at least have the opportunity to go to camp. If they don't want to go to camp, um, I, you know, I tell parents all the time, yeah, 
He may not want to go to camp, but I promise you if you'll send him to camp, he'll want to come back to camp. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I just think that's part of that. And it is part of, the, part of the commitment that we as team has made. And as I've started working with IDS, we actually are, uh, me and uh, Jerry Alston, are going to begin to do similar type things for older kids now. I mean, we're talking about transitional age kids that are high school age kids and uh, young adults. We're going to start doing similar type things for, for older kids as well through, uh, through IDS. So that commitment's there. We've just got to make sure that we can begin to get the, the resources to make those things happen. And Dennis has been great. He sends me emails all the time about, I found this, I found this, and they've been very helpful. So uh, we're working toward that. It's just getting the teachers to understand mm -hmm. the kids. And I, just, I hear you talking, and I just wish they were here to hear yeah. you talking about the invisible signs because they think, they look at Tyler and go, well, you know, so what? He's got, you know, a diagnosis of Asperger's. Um, you know, he should be able to function exactly the way. I think it's worse is. for Asperger's than autism. I think you're right. I think like mm -hmm. autistic kids, they're clearly they help delayed, yeah. and they're clearly right. Mikey is, you know, yeah. clearly there's something different about him. Mm -hmm. But I think the kids that are Asperger's, I think it, it is tougher. I think the schools don't know as much what to do with them. They don't, and we've got, we have two new teachers. We've had two new teachers this year. One who says that she has been, you know, teaching kids like this, but I don't think any of them. <laughs> My response to folks that do that, 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 of course, I, you know, I, I don't mix for words a lot of times because I've been doing this long enough, is that, I had a teacher not too long ago over in Alabama that says, I've been teaching kids with autism for about four years. And I've said, well, you really should be getting better at it then because this is really not the right thing to be doing. I mean, you've got some really distinct issues in this classroom. Um, so four years, we really got a lot of unlearning to do right now. And she just didn't know quite how to react to that. But it was really the truth because some of the things that she thought was a good practice in that classroom was the exact things that were causing some of the very troublesome behaviors out of the two kids. There were, there, were so, there were four kids in the classroom, but there were two kids, all four of these kids had Asperger's syndrome, but there were two of them that were really, really handfuls for her. And she was her own worst enemy because of her own, her own you know, practices, so to speak. And so just because a person says, I've worked with these kids, that doesn't mean you've worked with them right. I mean, that's part of, <laughs> that's, that's something that can't be, uh, can't be ignored, so. Uh, I mean, my hat's off to them to even, you know, be willing to do so. Absolutely. I just don't think they have a clear understanding, and they they tend to um, they tend to think, uh, well, we're not going to cut them any slack. All right. You know, and that just is so frustrating. It is. You know, um, you know if he comes home with five assignments and he only gets back with two because he has meltdowns all sure. through the evening. And they don't care, you know, and we've even had it in the IEP, you know, give them extra time, don't penalize him, but, you know, I just found out yesterday, he didn't do one of his assignments, it was one of the, it was one of the nights where he had five different things to do, and he was yeah. so overwhelmed yeah. that night, and I tried to get in contact with all of them, and they won't return emails or phone calls or anything, mm. and it's just, it's gotten kind of, you know, tough to communicate with them, but, you know, I thought... I wish they could understand that, you know, he's not, I mean, they just have this wrong idea of right. what what their expectations of sure. him are, and, and they don't. They're like, okay, 30 points off for this, and mm -hmm. 25 points off for that. Didn't show you work. That's, you know, 10 points off for that. Yeah, and you know, the thing about, the thing that gets, that's, that's part of that misunderstanding is, is that um, many professions, and teachers are certainly probably some of the most, um, the, I guess the most strict but to this belief is that I'm the teacher. The agenda that I set up in this classroom is the agenda of everybody in this classroom. But what they don't understand is, is that a kid with Asperger's syndrome, you know, it's like Tyler, he has his own agenda. <laughs> and and it, it doesn't mean that he's, it, and that agenda is not that he's not going to learn. It's just that that agenda is very driving. It's a very strong force in, his, in who he is. And if you think that you can completely defy this force, well, you're just going to be grossly wrong. And so your agenda and that person's agenda at some point has to be realized that, that those two things have got to come together. But I see teachers all the time that really stumble over. I mean, they fall on their own sword with a kid because they're saying, I've been doing this for 20 years. 
And every kid's done it to this point, and this one is too. And my response is usually, you know, you'll call me in two weeks and you'll really want some help, trust me. Um, it, it's, it's a matter of, of a lack of the understanding of this internal mechanism that's so much a part of autism. And maybe, I, I would probably agree with you, Michelle, that, that kids with Asperger's syndrome, they, they just like kids with more classic autism, they have very strong internal drives about certain things, certain agendas and stuff. But a, a classically autistic child has a more acceptable set of understandings between people around because they, they, they clearly have a significant challenge. Whereas a kid with Asperger's syndrome seems to be only a child that's being, um, you know, very covert. Uh, yeah, um, or overt, not covert. It, it, they, sometimes they're overt and covert, being very oppositional because they're trying to carry out their agenda and they realize that that gets them in trouble so they get a little sneakier about it. But at the same time, that's not because they're simply misbehaving. It's simply because you're not ignoring a set of circumstances and you only want it to be yours, your own agenda. And so we, we see the math thing, for instance, several, many, many years ago, actually this has been a lot of years ago, went down to Florida on a case where a kid had been failed uh, and um, it had gotten really ugly down there and so a mutual friend of mine said, can you come down and help this family? We went down there and what happened was this was a, a, an 11th grader who was taking calculus who had autism and so calculus, I mean just do that math, start, pardon the pun, but I mean doing calculus so we're not really talking about an academically challenged kid here, we're talking about a kid that, but he wasn't showing all of his work and uh, the, the teacher was just, that's it, He's, he, he was getting F's, F's, F's. And so the line of questioning went sort of like, when I was talking to the teacher, it was a male teacher, and I said, well, what about his answers? Oh, he always gets the right answers. I said, well, so, but see, he said, but I need to see that he knows what he's doing. I said, well, okay, well, there's only two ways a person can come up with the right answer on a math problem. You either know how to do it, or you're cheating. Maybe you're guessing, but you can't guess consistently right all the time, not on calculus. And I said, so we're going to say it's one of those two things. So which one do you think it is? Well, no, he doesn't cheat. He says, I, I don't doubt that he can come up with the right answers, but he refuses to show his work. And, I, and he said, I need to know how he's doing it. And that, that's when I was getting a little frustrated. And I said, trust me, you wouldn't understand how he's doing this, even if he were to write it down. It's just probably his own little mechanism. So he would start showing his work at a certain point. And this thing went all the way to their school board, and the school board upheld the failing grade um, for this kid. And the parents got so frustrated, the kid got so frustrated because he'd failed, and kids with Asperger's syndrome do not like to fail. Failure is not an option. If they see themselves as failing, they won't even, or, or potential for failure, they won't even start sometimes. Well, I'm not going to do that because I might fail. So they're very, they're very uh, resistant to that. Anyway, so this kid, they, the whole thing got just ugly, and they pulled him out of school, he took his GED, went on to a community college, got a degree in computers, and uh, the last time that I talked to him, which has probably been 10 or 11 years ago since I talked to the family, he um, was in uh, South Florida and he, he designs uh, these programs when you go to the hospital, you know how they ask all your information and you have to type it in, it goes into a database. He designs programs that collects that information so that it goes into the database correct for insurance reimbursement and a variety of things. That's what he does as a profession. Um, makes like six figures. And so I've often wanted to, you know, get him and this teacher back together and say, you know, all that's water under the bridge. But I just want to do one thing. I'd like to compare checkbooks. Let's just do that, okay? You know, so uh, it's just, you know, it's just a real frustrating set of circumstances because it doesn't have to be that way. It really doesn't have to be that way. Yeah, he gets caught. He gets counted off. And he does stuff in his head. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, he does stuff in his head, and that's why it's not on paper. But yeah. You know, ten points off to yeah. show your work. Okay, we're about out of time. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and I know this can I go off on and on. But I will. I, I I will be. Like I said, because of my work with IDS, I will be uh, available and around. And so, um, if you if you uh, you know if you have questions or something, call up to IDS. Um, many of y'all know how to get me at my office with team. That's cool too. Um, I'm here to help you out, and so you know, feel free to contact me, and let's see what we can do. And I look forward to being involved more with this group uh, because of uh, my work with Julie as well too, as we put the new resource center together. So.